Thank you very much. Um, if you didn't get one of those monkey problems, there's some more back there. Um, the reason that you have a monkey problem is, is very closely connected with what I believe teaching and learning mathematics is about. And that is, it's about interesting problems. And I think that that's an interesting problem. Some of what I'm going to talk about today is stuff that a lot of you already know. Some of it is stuff you may have heard. Some of it is stuff that you will find not the least bit interesting. And so during that time, think about the monkey problem. In other words, I don't want you to sit here and be bored. I want you to have tasks at hand to do. The monkey problem is, I think, an engaging problem. Um, if you haven't seen it before, I think it'll keep you busy for the conference. Um, <laughs> And there's, there's some things about it as well that, um, that I would uh, just, I may never come back to it today. I may come back to it this afternoon. I don't know. It depends on how things go. But think of it as, as, as an interesting task for you to do. And if you don't figure it out, give it to your students and let them work on it. By the way, that's probably not a bad way to start this. Um, there's abs, in fact, it is one of the most powerful things a teacher can do, is to give their students a problem they don't know how to do. And just say, I've been working on this for four days, and I have no idea how to do it. Can any of you do it? Some of your students will say, oh, my teacher can't do it. I couldn't do it, so I won't bother. But there's a handful that will just dig in. Because they want to be the one that can do the problem that even their teacher couldn't do. So, uh, you know, there, there's, there's the, the, the contrast between be prepared, but be prepared doesn't mean that you know all the answers and everything for everything that you're going to have your students work on. Teaching, I think, is about giving kids tasks and letting them work on those tasks. Uh, I also, as Fern was introducing me, I, um, she misspoke. Um, I am an award-winning teacher. There's no way I've been an award-winning teacher for 42 years. <laughs> um, one of the things that we all have to keep in mind is that this is a really, really hard job. This teaching math is really hard. Most first or second year teachers think it's going to be pretty easy. They think they're going to be able to come in and explain things and the kids will listen and get it. And, and <laughs> right? That certainly was my belief. And it took a while to figure out that that just didn't work. And so some people just leave. What they thought it meant to be a teacher didn't work. So I'll go find something else to do. And so we're losing lots of potentially good people. Part of our job as teachers and teacher leaders or whatever is to convince those people it takes a long time to be good. My estimated guideline is that after about five years, I had some idea of what I was doing and I wasn't, I was doing more good for kids than damage. <laughs> it was 10 years, and I remember specifically, it was 10 years before I felt like, okay, now I think I'm good enough at this that I am worthy to speak at ICTM. I now know enough that maybe I have a couple of insights that not everybody knows. But that was another thing I found out quickly is that that there's a lot of things you think everybody knows and a whole lot of people just don't. So anyway, okay, so uh, let's get on with the show. Um, I do have a problem here that does have a lot to do with what we're gonna do. I, I, I specifically did wanna walk around and hand it to each of you so I could take a look at you and say hi and all that. This one I just wanna get in your hand. So it would be great if you could pass those out, sure. Okay. Um, just a couple of observations, and then I'll let you work a little longer, because it's not time yet to talk about it. Um, first of all, J. 
John pointed out that the problem is not well defined. That I didn't say whether you can use a point more than once. My implication was that you can. Uh, so that is a wonderful observation. And that is exactly the kind of thing that you want to have happen when you ask kids to work on a problem. You want them to think about what is the statement of the problem, what does it mean, what are the rules? The first answer that a lot of people got was 30. Oh, another observation. Um, and this is perhaps the most important thing I have to offer you today. We passed out the problems and I started walking around. And a few of you started working on the problems, but most of you were checking your cell phones, looking at the program, worrying about this or that or the other thing, talking about how you had to do this or that or the other thing. In other words, 75% of you were not on task. How do I know that? Because I walked around and I watched what you do. That's what teachers have to do. If you're standing up in the front waiting for something to happen, your kids will not be on task. They will be texting kids and they will be, they will be doing all kinds of things. They will not be doing what you think they're doing unless you are amidst them and among them and looking at what they do. Teaching by walking around is really the only way you can make sure that people are on task. Somebody even said, do you want me to do this? No, I just thought I, you know. But, but there's more. There's more. Once people got on task, the room got very quiet because people were on task. But then I gradually noticed that it got louder and louder. Why? Because people started talking about the problem. And I specifically tried, uh, tried to say that, the, well, I believe that the first answer that many people get is 30. That was what I expected people to get, right? How do you get 30? Okay, you interpret the problem as meaning Okay, there's one by one, and there are 16 of those, four by four, and then there could be two by twos, and there could be nine of those, right? And three by threes, there are four. Isn't that interesting? 16, four, and then some people don't get the four by four, so sometimes you end up with 29, but right there, Right there, isn't that, isn't that interesting? Just right there, there's some cool math going on here. The fact that you keep getting perfect squares. Why do you keep getting perfect squares? Why does that work? That's a good discussion. And I would hope some student would observe that that's what's going on. But then it occurred to somebody somewhere along the line that that was a square. Oh, 31 then. <laughs> so I actually saw something like that happen. Right, okay, so there are more. And so then the problem becomes more complicated. And then people start discussing it and talking about it and arguing about it. Okay, so I'll give you another couple minutes. Uh, so far, there's someone in the room who claims to have had 49. There's something very nice about that number 49, because it's, it's one of these. But if you add these up, you don't get a perfect square, do you? So, so far, somebody claims to have had 49. Are we ready to accept that there's 49? What could be, well, first place, maybe they counted something as a square that we don't think is a square. Okay? But maybe there's more. So I want to carry this a little bit further until someone has a convincing argument. That is, they think they can convince us how many there are. Because again, this problem is irrelevant. 
What's important is making convincing arguments. That's what we want our students to be able to do. How does that happen? Well, it doesn't happen unless they have a vested interest in it. They're not going to argue about something if they don't believe it and if other people don't disbelieve it. So you have to give them discussion-worthy tasks, tasks they care about. And I'll bet you that right now, every one of you is kind of curious as to what the right answer is. You just sort of like to know if you're right or not. So discuss it some more. You could even talk to somebody from another table if you wanted to, that would be legal, but take a little more time. I know you're not done yet. Not because I know how many there are, because I don't, but the discussions are still going. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I one other thing. I, one of the problems that's happened with aging is, is that I forget things. And, and this is something that I really would like to point out, and I won't if I don't do it now. One of the things that I've, Evanston Ta Township High School has a young teacher who is an absolute superstar. I have no idea how somebody after four years of teaching knows this much about teaching. He's just incredible. His name is Zach Herman. He's giving a presentation Saturday morning at eight o'clock. Go to it, you will learn stuff. No matter how long you've been here, you will learn stuff. He, but one of the things I learned from Zach is that as you walk around and you listen to what people say, you just project it. You don't have to say anything. You just project it. So these numbers are the numbers that I heard people say they had. I never told you that's what it was, but most people figured it out. And so, so without interrupting, without whatever, you, he, he also will write things like, oh, there's the sideways ones. Or just things he hears people say without ever saying a word. It is a marvelous technique. I would. Um, I would recommend it to you. Anyway, carry on, please.